Hello and welcome to my video on summarizing quantitative data. I'd like to mention that on page 55 of our textbook, uh, there is this little table at the bottom of the page that talks about the different types of grouping methods uh, for quantitative data. So here we have single value grouping, limit grouping, and cut point grouping. And we can notice that uh, we know which, uh, which grouping method to use is based upon the characteristics of the type of data. So single value grouping, and as we will see here in a few minutes, is used when the data value are uh, basically integer value and the range of the data values, the range, that's very important, uh, is small. Limit point grouping is also used when the data is expressed as integer values, uh, but the data values, the range of the data is large. Okay, so you have a wider range of the data, whereas single grouping, you will have a smaller range of the data. Uh, and then finally, cut point grouping is used when the data set comes to us as a continuous data and uh, used in normally represented as decimals. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with each method. So summarizing quantitative data then is, again, there are three ways of doing this with the uh, single value grouping, limit grouping, and the cut point grouping. And this, the idea is that we will formulate these things called classes. Uh, a lot of times you may hear me use the word bins, but classes. There's another way of thinking of these as buckets. So if you take a look at my picture over here, we can see that there is like 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. Uh, and these form the classes or the buckets. So any data value that lies between 20 and 30 will fall into that first bucket. And then the second bucket, 30 to 40 and so forth. But it's a little deceiving. Uh, on the 30 and the 40 and so forth, but we'll get that cleared up here later on. So again, the idea is how do we form these buckets? And then, then what we do is once we have the buckets formed, as you can see with the tally marks or the frequency of students, we just go ahead and count how many fall into those buckets. So this is known as the frequency or the count. And then finally, although it's not on this picture, we will talk about what's called the relative frequency of each class. That is, what percent of the overall total falls into each bucket. Uh, important to note, as you can see, that these uh, uh, classes, they must be disjoint. So the idea is, where does the 30 fall? Uh, a lot of times, that 30 will fall up at the top one. And then we'll go from 30 to 40. Technically, we could probably go 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and so forth on that picture just to help you out. Uh, but again, they must be disjoint, meaning that they, they cannot overlap in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there is a rule of thumb that says that the number of bins have to be between number uh, between 50 and 20. So no more than 20 classes and no, no less than five. And each observation can only fall into one bin. You can't have a number falling in both the bin 30 to 40 and 40 to 50. And then finally, all classes should be the same width. And talking about the bin width or the class width uh, is kind of a tricky deal, but we'll, we'll make that clear here uh, in just a few minutes. So let's go ahead and get started with our single value grouping. So as we mentioned, the val in this case, the values themselves will form the classes or the bins, so that the each individual val values. Uh, these are usually uh, primarily used when the data is discrete, and then finally it may be used uh, as long as there is a small range of values, as we kind of previously mentioned before. So let's take a look at this data set known as the sibling data. This table, this picture on the right is not uh, a picture of, but the idea with the sibling data is notice that we have the range of values going from 0, 1, 2, we jump to 4, we jump to 6, and then we have this 12. So the idea is that the range of the data values from 0 to 12, that's kind of small, all right, with 12 kind of really being out there. So uh, the idea then now is that we will use the data values 0, 1, 2, 6, and 12, and don't forget 4, and we will use those to formulate the bins in and of themselves. So let's take a look, see. So when we go to start off our tables, we always uh, form this class, which is where the bins are located, frequency, which is the counts, and the relative frequency. So no matter how we're grouping, just like we did with non-numeric data, you know, we do the exact same thing with these column headers right here. 
And let's just note that the number zero, it shows up one time. So let's just notice that since we're using this single value grouping, hopefully it makes sense that the class is a single value itself. So we'll take a look at zero and uh, we only have one of those. So let's just also observe that our next value is one. So what we'll do is we'll count up the total number of ones. And as we can easily see, there is five ones. So we'll put that there. So our next value is two. So we'll come over here and we can easily see that number two forms the next bin. And so there is uh, four number twos there. All right, so hopefully you're starting to see the pattern here. Uh, here there is no threes, so I'll go ahead and put a zero in for the threes. And then for the fours, we can easily see there is three fours. And then to go ahead and finish off our table here, uh, there's no fives. And we can easily see there are two sixes and two twelves. And we have a grand total of 17 data values. So to construct the relative frequency, the relative frequency then just takes the frequency, how many is in this bin, and divides it by the grand total. So if I take 1 and divide that by 17, uh, we can easily see we're going to get 0 0.06. If I take 5, divide that by 17, I'm going to get 0.29. And if I take 4 and divide that by 17, I'm going to get 0.23 and so forth. And it's nice to note that as we add up all those numbers, 0 0.06, 0 0.29, 0 0.23 and so forth, it does add up to 1, which is what we would like. Now please note, there are times where... Uh, your total under the relative frequency may be a little bit low, for example, 0.99, or a little high, 0.1, or 1.1, or 1.2. Please note that that's usually due to round off errors. So if you ever add these up and you get something a little bigger or a little smaller, note it's always 100%, but the reason why it could be a little smaller or a little bigger is because of round off error when you go to round those relative frequencies. Our next grouping method then is the limit grouping. So limit grouping is used uh, when we have our discrete data. And here we actually use these things called class limits. So we form these buckets. So as you can see on this little picture, we got 41 to 49, 50 to 58, 59 and 67 and so forth. So these are the buckets or the bins. They're not the individual data values themselves. And there is a way to come up with how we want to formulate these bins. We'll discuss that later. Well, it's particularly useful, this, this particular method, as we mentioned early, uh, when we have the, des uh, the data set as whole numbers and there is a large range of data. Okay, So you'll notice uh, that with our age data set or the number of siblings data set we just looked at, we had a small range of values. Now we're going to take a look where the range of values are a little bit bigger themselves. Okay, so let's just note that here we have the ages of best actresses. And here in red, I have the smallest value is 41. The largest value is 61. So here we have a range of about 20 years. That's a pretty good chunk of change here. So as we can see then that what I did was I took all the women, all the actresses that won a, a best actress award. Uh, and I just randomly selected 21. Okay. So here what we'd like to do is go ahead and bin this data and then compute our table with our frequencies, relative frequencies. But here as we're instructed and we can see, here we're going to use a minimum of 40 and then we're going to use this class width of 5. So we got to talk about what those are. So notice that even though the minimum value is 41, we can go a little bit lower. And a lot of times this is what we do uh, when we go to create these tables. We just go a little bit lower. You don't want to go too far. You don't want to go to like the 30 because 30 to 35, there's nothing in there. So a little bit lower than your minimum value. Get a good starting point. So again, we're going to start off with our column headers of class, frequency, and relative frequency. So as we are, are instructed here, we were instructed to use a minimum age of 40 and a class width of 5. So here I kind of started off the first couple of rows uh, just to... Uh, just to notice what's going on here. So the trick part is this idea of a class width. So what does the class width mean? And what it does not mean is that it does not mean that this is going to be five units. That is not the class width. So this is known as the lower class bound, the 40, 
and this 44 up here is known as the upper class bound. All right, the difference of those two is four, not five. All right, so then the question is, is what is the class width? So notice that by definition, the difference between the lower limit of a class, so in this case, coming over here to the number 40, and the next lower limit of the next higher class. So if I come down here to the next higher class, that would be this bucket right here, and notice its lower limit is 45, and notice if I take the difference between these two lower limits of these successive classes, that that difference, 45 minus 40, is 5. So as I continue on, notice that we go from 40 to 44, 45 to 49, and again, let's notice that as I form these bins right here, the difference of these guys, these first two numbers, 55 and 60 is 5. 50 and 55 is 5. It also falls out that the difference of these two numbers is also 5, okay? So these are also 5. <coughs> so then the game plan here is to start counting. So notice if I come over here and we want to find the amount of ages that fall between 40 to 44, then I just start coming over here and notice I have 1, 2, 3, 4. So I have four that will fall into there. So right over here under the frequency, I will write the number four. And for 45, let's just notice we have one, two, three, and I need one more. So there's one, two, three, and there it is, four, all right? So let's just notice that if I go ahead and continue doing this, I end up with my frequencies of 44472. Again, you can go back and double check that. Feel free to rewind uh, the video and you can go back and double check for yourself. And then notice that if I take 4 and divide that by 21, that will give me 0.19. Take 7 and do the same thing. And if I add up the relative frequencies, they all add up to 1. So for some additional notes, let's just note that the lower class limit is right here. It's the number 40. The upper class limit is the largest value that goes into the class. So here we see it's 44. So for this class right here, the lower class limit is 55, and the upper class limit is 59. Okay. And the class mark, well, the class mark is also known as the midpoint. So if I take... Uh, come over here to this class here, add these two numbers up, the midway point here would be 42. So if I come down here, the midway point for my second class down here, uh, 45 to 49, is 47, 52, 57, and so forth. And finally, our cut point grouping. So let's just recall that here again we are going to create uh, the classes using these things that we call cut points. And just like with limit grouping, each class consists of a range of values. And again, let's just recall that this method is uh, primarily used when the data is continuous or when you see decimal valued uh, data set. So here's a data set of uh, 25 states where the gas tax. So I actually went out, did a little research and of all the 50 states I went ahead and randomly selected 25 of them and the tax that they have on the ga gallon of gasoline. So just like we did previously, I've already taken a look and found out the smallest and the largest because we got to make sure that all the data values get covered in our classes. Okay, so here we are instructed that we want to start with a minimum of 12 and then we want to have a class width of 8. So in this case here, uh, let's just take a look. Our columns are still titled the same, but here we're a little bit different. Since we have continuous data, again, notice my class width is still 8. So 12 minus 20, 20 minus 12, or you take the difference of these first two numbers, it's still 8. But notice that up here, we're not going to 19, okay? We're going up to, but not including 20. Since we're dealing in the continuum, we can get as close to the number 20 but not included in our first band. So notice that 20 comes down here, and then we'll go up two, but not including 28. So we maintain the bin width by definition, or the cut point width, 
here by definition is 8. So that means my next one should start at 28 and go up to, but not including, uh, 36. Uh, again, that under, another way of reading this is 12 up to, but not including 20. So again, if I come over here and start counting my data values for the first bin, let's just notice that for the first bin, I get these four that are in red. So under my frequency, I put the number four, and then I can go back through and find the number 20 through 28, which is going to be these 10 data values here, so I can start filling in my chart. So the first frequency here will be 4, and then the red here will be 10, and then again, if you want, feel free to pause the video to double check yourself because on the next slide here, we're going to uh, have our completed table. All right. So go ahead and feel free to pause. So this is what you should have come up with if you uh, went ahead and paused the video and completed this yourself. So again, 4 divided by 25 is 0.16. 10 divided by 25 is 0.4. Again, these numbers are rounded. Okay, so this completes our video just about here, I guess, uh, regarding the three grouping methods. So again, the notice here, it's a little bit different. Uh, the lowest class cut point, according to the definition of our author, is the smallest value that goes into the class. So technically, this is the lower class cut point. So this number 20 down here on our next round here is 20. That's our lowest. This one's our lowest. This one's our lowest and so forth. The upper class point, notice it says, is the smallest value that goes in the next higher class. So the lower cut point is 12. The upper cut point for this class is 20, which is this guy here. All right. So I don't know. It gets kind of weird. I, I get it. It is kind of weird. Trust me. I get it. So if you want to say this is the lower cut point, this is the upper cut point, I get it. No, I don't get the difference, I guess. I don't know. So the lower cut point for this one is 36. Technically, the upper cut point for this same band is 44. Yeah, I know. And again, the class width then is just the midpoint uh, between the two classes. Are the class, yeah. And then the class mark is the midpoint. So we already got the class width there. So the moral of the story, again, is if you go to page 55, uh, we've already seen this. I'm not going to reiterate this slide, but please make sure that when you come to class uh, that you have this down and that this makes sense. And please uh, make sure that you do take some time to review uh, to do your readings as well. So when we come to class and we get to this part, uh, since we've already covered our lecture part here, your learning part is here, we're just going to go ahead and move on with things like creating, creating the charts, creating the tables, and then reading some information. What is the class width? You know, if I hand you a chart, what is the class width? If I hand you a chart, what is the lower and upper limits? If I hand you a chart, how many, what is the frequency in each bound? and then compute the relative frequency uh, that is also in each bin. So that pretty much covers this video. So I hope this helped, and I'll see you in class.